Good evening, everybody. Um, I give a little thought um, with a little philosophical twist that I hope kind of launches the conversation, particularly with our guest this evening. And I've been looking at um, the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction. And with luck now, you can see a picture I just took, even from the polluted skies of London, um, the moon, a thin crescent, thin crescent there, there, looking rather beautiful uh, alongside. Jupiter and Saturn. You can see them very closely together, I hope. Um, Hang on, my, my, my mum just invaded this, so I've just muted her. Go away, mum. Sorry about that. <laughs> the Zoom bombers have gone, I hope. I was just explaining. You can see Jupiter there, the brighter of the two stars, and then Saturn. It, it was pretty clear, actually, and so I'm hoping that it'll be even clearer over the successive nights to the 21st of December, which is the shortest day of the year when Jupiter and Saturn will be almost completely coincidental to the naked eye anyway. So hence, it's a conjunction. Um, it's a rather wonderful thing to see. Um, good bit of therapy. If you want to just sort of watch something enter and decline in, in, in the sky, it has a certain um, lovely quality at this time of year. But of course, it raises lots of speculation as well. And I've already read an article saying, is this the star of Bethlehem? Is this what the wise men saw? some kind of rare celestial phenomenon like a conjunction in the sky you know maybe a comet maybe something else um and then i was looking at dante as you do and in dante beatrice in the divine comedy beatrice actually tells dante to resist explaining away these signs that you might see in life whether they be in the sky or they be more mundane on earth and the worry that Beatrice has is that if you explain them away, then you might miss their inner meaning. And at a time where it feels like we're, you know, could do with any meaning we might have, um, I was trying to hold open to the meaning of jovial Jupiter and, you know, the slightly melancholic um, god of time, Saturn, and what it might mean that patience, perhaps, and jovi joviality are coming together at this time of year where Christmas is half cancelled. Maybe it's saying to us that we just bit of patience and jovial Jupiter will still come our way. But I do like this idea that divination is actually a kind of everyday thing. You know, many people will attest to synchronicities. Others have dreams. Um, I work as a psychotherapist much of the time and um, dreams often explode in people's imaginations actually with the meaning they bring. They can be quite surprised at it. Um, the constraints of life, you know, they bring meaning. The ends, whether it be the ends of the year, the ends of the day, um, they carry meaning for us. And, you know, if only because we project onto these things, I wouldn't get too worried about where the meaning comes from. Um, the point is that meaning can be found and celebrations and saints days and the time of year and the shortest day and all these, these kind of things, which I think uh, um, Ron Hutton work, uh, writes about. Um, you know, there's a reason why they're kept. Um, they help us find shape, discover shape in our life. Um, so I just sort of wanted to offer you the thought of learning to follow your signs, as it were. Um, we take to life what we bring to life. Um, and I, I, I picked this up actually from Socrates. Um, this is the, the bit of philosophy in all this, that um, he's well known for having received an oracle from the god at Delphi, from Apollo at Delphi, um, and it shaped his life. Um, and I've always felt if it was good enough for Socrates, you know, one of these civilization defining characters, then, you know, surely it's good enough for me. One tip I did get from him, though, was that you don't just accept these things at face value. Um, you have to kind of work at them to understand them. You know, he went around Athens actually trying to disprove the Delphic Oracle. And it was only when he wrestled with it that he really understood what it meant. And I think this is because, you know, we're not actually robots. Um, we're called to participate in life, to find meaning and make meaning as well as discover meaning. Um, the modern day version of it perhaps wouldn't be that we're influenced by, you know, influences, inflows from the stars and planets. Um, we talk much more about being shaped by our genes or our rushing hormones or we're evolutionary byproducts. Well, you know, those things happen, but there's more to life than that. That's not the end of life. Um, so as I was looking at the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn and the moon this evening and looking forward to hearing what Ron Harton has to say with conversation with Tom, um, I was thinking we are meaning seeking, making and discovering creatures 
and that might be my Yuletide message to you all as we approach Christmas time, even in this strange year. Well, that's absolutely lovely, Mark. Thanks so much. Um, we are meaning-seeking creatures, and we're going to be seeking meaning in the next half an hour or so, up until about seven, with Doctor with Professor Ronald Hutton. Now, um, some of you will know that. Uh, well, I'm a huge fan of um, Professor Hutton's work. He is professor of history at Bristol University, and he's written a number of books uh, over the years, which should kind of span academia and uh, get into a more popular market as well. Um, this is a brilliant book, The Stations of the Sun, A History of the Ritual Year in Britain, which goes through Christmas, Easter and so on, and the history of these various festivals. Uh, he's written a course about paganism, is a well-known authority on it. He's written a book called, which is probably my favourite, is The uh, Rise and Fall of Merry England. And this book talks about how England did actually go through quite a merry phase. It's often said that Merry England was a myth, but I think Prop Hutton shows that uh, there was a lot of truth to it. Um, and above all, he's uh, probably the world's foremost historian and expert on merrymaking um, and merriment. Uh, now, let's see if we can unmute you. Are, are you there, Professor Hutton? My host has unmuted me. Thank you, my host. <laughs> Now, you haven't got a drink now, have you? Sometimes we have a drink at the beginning of our Zoom. Uh, I never drink on the job. Uh, the one thing I think I have in common with Alexander the Great is that both of us prefer to get drunk after a battle rather than before it. So there will be feasting and merrymaking in the, the Hutton rooms later on, I hope. It'll be solitary, being a weekday, but I have some hot mulled punch ready for tonight. <laughs> okay. Now... Let's talk a little bit first about the term you've had, because you're, a, uh, you're an academic, you're a professor, you're a teacher, you, you have undergraduate students. What's the term been like in Bristol? Um, like science fiction. On the rare occasions when I'm allowed to meet my students, they're all in masks and visors, so they all look as though they're about to rob banks. And I, I hadn't realised that when everybody's got masks and visors on, you can't actually recognize them. So it's hard to remember their names. You know, there, there are a whole lot of visual triggers that can enable me to memorize what my students are called. But when there's no visual way of distinguishing them, I can't do that. So the essential bond between a teacher and a student of the, the teacher remembering the name is lost. Now, what about lectures? I first heard about you because not one, but two of your former undergraduate students wrote to me, having read The Idler, I think, and said, you really, really must interview Professor Hutton. Um, his lectures on Christmas were absolutely brilliant. Have you been able to do these lectures this term? Only online, and I have to hide behind slides. It's uh, educational philosophy now that students can't remember anything unless they see a picture. And so uh, there we have a slide and you have my voice with it. The old walking through the audience, gazing into their eyes and reeling them into me spiritually as far gone. Oh, no, but the, the, those days are going to return, surely? I would hope so. OK, well, let's talk about Christmas, because that's the subject of um, this evening. Christmas is coming up. Uh, you know, are, are we going to be able to celebrate it at all? The government has been compared to the Puritan government of... Um, uh, Cromwell in the 17th century. But let's, let's go back to the, the real origins of Christmas. It's called Christ Mass. Now, what does that actually mean, that word? Because, of, of course, uh, the idea of a midwinter festival uh, predates the birth of Christ by probably thousands of years. Yeah, the oldest term for it that we still use regularly in England and the English-speaking world is Yule which is the pagan Viking name for their midwinter feast. Uh, don't ask me what it means. Linguists have argued for 200 years over that and not reached an agreement. It just means Yule. But Christmas means the church service held to honor the birth of Jesus Christ or the church service of Christ. It's Christ's own holy day. So you'd have Michaelmas for St. Michael's feast, Martinmas for St. Martin's feast, Lucimus for uh, Lucy's feast, which was last Sunday. Who was Lucy? She was uh, an early Christian martyr who died lengthily and horribly, as they're inclined to do. 
but she was associated with lights. Uh, her icon has a crown of lights on it, and that's why they sportingly gave her the uh, uh, feast day nearest the winter solstice by a week. The actual winter solstice, the shortest day, is given to St. Thomas because he had doubts. So he gets the shortest day. Now, what about the uh, pagan celebrations of something like Christmas? I mean, I suppose the most famous pagans are ancient Rome and ancient Greece, uh, but presumably there are others. Yeah, wherever we find pagans emerging into history, they bring the midwinter festival with them. The Anglo-Saxons have probably the most haunting name for it, Mosrenich, the Mother Night, which I think is the most wonderful name for the primeval darkness that gives birth to the year. Yule, I've mentioned. The Romans actually had a Twin Peak festival like us. We have Christmas and New Year. They had Saturnalia and Calendai. And Saturnalia is the ult ultimate bad girl, bad boy boozer. Uh, lots and lots of misbehavior and lots and lots of uh, decorations. And uh, lots and lots of inversion with uh, mistresses and masters waiting on slaves and so on. And then everybody goes quiet on the 23rd of December and they wait for the daylight to start to lengthen. And when you get to the end of December, it's lengthened quite a bit. And so they give the sun a birthday party for the calendar, which is on the 1st of January. So that's their New Year. And so the minutes tick towards midnight on New, on New Year's Eve, and we all have that shiver up our spine. That's a feeling thousands of years old. So, the, so Christmas and New Year um, go together, and they have gone together for forever, really, for millennia. I call Greg Ledby, so Gregory, sorry, has just uh, told us he's got a poem, Mogrenich, in his latest book. So the name goes on. Sorry, uh, go again. Yeah, so, um, well, let, let's talk about this idea, which I think most of us vaguely have, that uh, the Christians took this pagan festival over and uh, sort of remade it. Yeah, uh, they... They, had, they ended up with quite a long festival. They ended up with 12 days, whereas the longest known pagan festival was about a week before that. So you get an extra ration of holiday out of medieval Christianity. And they load a lot of Christian theology onto it, apart from the nativity with all the, the stories associated. There's the three wise men who turn up late uh, on the 6th of January, Epiphany. And there's the feast that Christians generally now like to forget, which is the circumcision of Jesus Christ, which is on the 1st of uh, January, New Year's Day. So that, that's the sort of origin of the 12 days. Now, who was it in, uh, of the, among the early Christians who said, I mean, was there a committee of um, monks who sat down and said, OK, we're going to take over this Saturnalia and these pagan rites, we're going to call it Christmas, and he was born on the 25th? We'd like to think so. Uh, in fact, there's endless argument about how this came to be. What we think is the defi definitive starting point is 354 of the Christian era, when a calendar appears at Rome which has got Christmas on it, or what we think is Christmas on it. And it just spreads from there. The emotional thing about the 25th of December is that it's the end of the winter solstice. Ever since we got scientific instruments and people with the same language in both northern and southern hemisphere to talk to each other, we can be scientific about the solstice. We can pinpoint it to a minute on a particular date when the sun bounces off Capricorn and starts its recoil. But until the 19th century, you lacked all those things. So the solstice meant something very different and in many ways far more enchanted. And that is that through the year, as we all know, days get shorter and longer because the sun sets and rises at different points on the horizon. But you'll notice, maybe, that in December and June, it slows down considerably. And at sunset on the 20th of June and December, it seems to stop. And to the naked eye, it rises and sets at the same points on the horizon for a few days. And that's that magical time of the solstice, which is Latin for the sun stands still. It's that time which doesn't belong to one half of the year or the other, in which the fairies come out to play 
humans can contact the divine, the divine can contact the human. But it ends uh, around sunrise on the 25th of December. So the 25th of December is Sol Invictus, the Roman sun return. And that's when the Christians put Christmas. Oh, I don't know who that was. Now, the 12 days of Christmas, um, I think I remember reading in your stuff that uh, people really did take a whole 12 or sometimes longer days off. Um, and this was a time to, to stop working, to put down the tools and really just to sort of play games. Uh, and I think about the description of Christmas in Sagarwin and the Green Knight. Do you, do you think that was sort of more or less accurate? I suppose it's about lords and ladies, but um, uh, this was a feast for everybody, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, it would have been observed by everybody. And really, lords and ladies and peasants were more or less equally idle in winter in uh, a medieval society. Uh, lords and ladies do things like progresses and feasts and tournaments and uh, campaigns, and you can't do those in midwinter, uh, except a feast in your own home. And peasants just don't have much agricultural work to do at midwinter. Uh, the ploughing starts in January, the livestock have been salted down around Halloween. So there's this three month break of utter idleness and boredom. And although this is the last company on earth in which I'd say anything against being idle, the long, dark, claustrophobic vista of three months really needs a knees up right in the center of it. <laughs> and there we go, the midwinter feast. Now, how did it progress through medieval times? Let's say from uh, sort of a thousand to 1450 or, or 1500. Um, did, did the church elders always look upon the, the, the feasting and the partying uh, with a sort of benevolent gaze, or did they sometimes disapprove of it? They disapproved violently of two customs, which they condemned all over Western Europe, uh, except Britain, and uh, eventually wiped out uh, between the years 400 and 1000. And again and again, they specified that the two things that we mustn't do, you know, make some reasonable person want to run out and do them immediately. Uh, one is uh, for men to dress up in the skins of animals and wear the antlers of deer and the horns of bulls. Can't argue with that. And the other is to represent, to make the old woman. Now, actually, we don't really know what either of those meant, whether making the old woman is making an effigy or it's somebody dressing up as an old woman. We don't know. And although we can have all sorts of perfectly obvious, good speculative ideas as to what the old woman, whom the old woman should have represented, we actually don't know. And we don't know because in the end, the church councils and reforming bishops did crush the customs concerned. And uh, when they were gone, the church became a whole lot happier about midwinter. Sad story. Yeah, well, so, so, so they sort of um, cut down on things like wearing antlers, but that's yeah. really gone away, hasn't it? Because you, you see, well, perhaps not this year, but you see young men drunkenly staggering down Oxford Street with antlers on their head. That's because of uh, an underestimated genius, uh, an academic. They, they do have their uses occasionally. <laughs> uh, Clement Clark Moore, who was a professor of Hebrew and theology in the college at New York City in the early 19th century. And in 1821, he writes uh, a poem for his children. And we all still know it, it was the night before Christmas. And all, I, I shorten a bit, and all through the house, nothing was stirring. Even the mouse. If, if this were live, you see, then I'd cut my ears and the whole audience would shout back the other lines at me. Uh, but uh, since we can't do the kind of stadium rock effect here, uh, <laughs> I'll point to Moore's genius in doing something really weird in that poem. And that is he revamped St. Nicholas. Nicholas is a bishop from Asia Minor, alias Turkey, a patron saint of children in the Middle Ages. And children got given presents, if they were good, on his feast, which is the 6th of December. And he is Santa Claus in Dutch. The Dutch found this city called New Amsterdam. The English nick it and rename it New York. And the Dutch are still there by 1800. 
and they still have their Santa Claus custom, 6th of December. But Clement turns Santa into this amazing spirit of the northern midwinter. He's not a bishop anymore. He's got a red bishop's cloak, but it's trimmed into a furry robe. And he travels in a sleigh drawn by reindeer with cute names. And he comes down a chimney on Christmas Eve to give children presents. Now, we don't know where this came from. We don't know what more was on to produce this, but it's a completely original creation. And it takes New York by storm. His poems pirated and published. He reclaims the rights. And then Santa spreads from the apple across America. And then in the 1880s, crosses the Atlantic to England and merges with our Father Christmas. And that's where the antlers come from. They come from the fevered brain of a middle-aged academic sitting in his study in New York City in 1821. If he'd had no children, we'd have no Santa. It's amazing. So it's it's a sort of combination of Father Christmas, who was um, he was a, a, an old pagan character, um, with a sort of semi-invention of an American poet in the 1820s. Absolutely. So uh, Father Christmas is much older than our present Santa Claus. Uh, he was born in 1616. And he appears in a couple of pamphlets, probably the original one is by Ben Jonson, the great playwright and poet friend of Shakespeare's. And he's created to oppose Puritans who want to abolish Christmas. And uh, he is not very much like Santa is now. He is not interested in children. He is personification of adult revelry, he doesn't give anybody presents, doesn't travel around anywhere. And what he does is encourage feasting and merrymaking and general idleness, Tom. OK, well, let's talk about feasting, merrymaking and general idleness. I mean, it seems like it's such a good idea, Christmas. It was such a natural idea. Christmas, in fact, predates Christmas. Um, it was been a very successful festival until uh, the Puritan Revolution. So, I mean, we all know from reading Twelfth Night in about 1601 or something, um, the character of Malvolio, who represents the Puritans, and they're these sort of finger-wagging anti-fun people who Shakespeare seems to be sort of satirising. What actually happened? Because, I mean, Christmas was actually banned, I think, for 15 years uh, in the UK uh, during the Commonwealth period, um, and and also later in Boston. Now, could you, could you talk us through a little bit, um, you know, what happened there? What happened to the old customs of feasting and revelry and merrymaking. Why was it removed for 15 years? That story is half right. Uh, thanks to Covid, I hear again and again, Cromwell cancelled Christmas. 50% um, correct. Uh, Cromwell didn't do it because he wasn't in power when it got banned. It got banned by his party, the Puritans, the Roundheads who won the Civil War, year after the Civil War, 1647. And what they ban is church services. That's it. They allow anybody who wants to, as a result, to open their shop on Christmas Day. But they don't ban any secular celebration of Christmas. They aren't interested in it. So the story that Cromwell banned mince pies or Christmas pudding is uh, a rollicking modern myth. It's Although, not true, really. That's so disappointing. I, I, but I thought that you, um, Ronald, in your books, I'm sure you say somewhere that uh, there are these sort of secret underground Christmas parties and Cromwell sent soldiers in to sort of bust them up. That's Maples. That was Maples, right. Yeah, that's summer rebel. That the uh, Tudor and Stuart equivalent of raves. <laughs> but uh, Christmas feasting just went on unstopped. Uh, but there were bootleg Christmas church services. The diarist John Evelyn was in one in 1656 and got raided by the cops, well, by Cromwell's Ironsides, who arrested everybody for uh, a bootleg service. But the revelry went on. But Christmas did become a place of uh, opposition to the regime, which was unpopular because of heavy taxes and joylessness and militarization. So uh, there were riots at Christmas 1647, the first Christmas after the ban, at Canterbury and Ipswich and uh, uh, Bury St Edmunds. But the actual Christmas riots? 
yeah, shop. Well, it's a good way of starting a party. Uh, shopkeepers who'd opened their shops had their wares plundered and were tossed in blankets or beaten with holly bushes. And holly bushes were put up all over Canterbury, rather like maypoles, as rallying points for uh, partying. Oh, I see. So, so if you'd opened a shop on Christmas Day, um, that showed that you were being anti-Christmas because, of course, you should be idle. Um, and so if commerce was still going on, then the, the pro-Christmas uh, protesters would attack your shop for not celebrating Christmas. Yes, oh, arch idler, you're absolutely right. <laughs> uh, right on every score there. And uh, Christmas was celebrated in the same volume. It, it, in London, uh, the members of Parliament came out and found that uh, the church at the entrance to the House of Commons, it's still there, St Margaret Westminster, was decorated with holly and ivy and they were livid. The Lord Mayor went around London trying to pull down the holly and ivy decorations from the public fountains, the systems. Um, the, the, the quintessence of this for me, the, the most beautiful pigeonhole remark, is when the House of Commons met, as it was supposed to, on Christmas Day, 1656. And one of the MPs stood up and said, I notice there's hardly anybody in this bloody chamber. And just for the record, I was kept awake all night by people celebrating this feast we're supposed to have abolished. So in the secular area, completely ineffectual, but they did close the churches. Now, what, what lay behind this hatred of Christmas? It's uh, a belief that it isn't, it isn't scriptural. Uh, you don't find uh, any direction from Jesus or his apostles to celebrate the Feast of the Nativity. And also, it's pagan in its origins. There's no doubt about that. Uh, it's not only scriptural in the sense that it's not in the Bible, but if you know when shepherds watch their flocks by night in Palestine, it's May or September. It's never at midwinter. So the whole thing is biblical nonsense. And if you believe the Bible is the word of God and you stick to it, then Christmas looks decidedly dodgy. The Scots went the extra mile. They abolished Christmas in their Reformation, 1560. And after a, a bit of toing and froing and civil war in the 17th century, abolished it for good in 1690. And the date at which Christmas at last became a full public holiday in Scotland, when the Scots finally gave up, was 1974. Not till 1974. That's right. I, I chuckle to myself looking at the greater redness of the Welsh and the Scots to close down people in the recent uh, COVID epidemic and think, oh yes, that's what radical evangelical Protestantism will do for you. The Presbyterian Kirk and the Chapel having their revenge. Well, you can't help but think that some of the puritanical tendencies of you know, certain people, it could be a parliament or, you know, certain authority figures have been sort of excused by um, the virus. Do you feel that at all? But, you know, it's like, oh, well, this is great because now I can ban stuff uh, with good reason. I am. I'm unwilling to give a blanket agreement to that because, you know, clearly there are a lot of sincere and worried medics out there. Uh, what I do say for me is that I gain a certain amount of unholy merriment from the sight of Boris Johnson, who was one of the more Saturnalian prime ministers we've ever had, struggling to accommodate himself to a Puritan regime. <laughs> well, that's exactly right. And it's, it's the, the, the writers on The Spectator are absolutely horrified that he's sort of uh, become, in a way, anti-libertarian. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting that uh, it's in many ways the tabloids, the Tory tabloids, that have turned out to be the champions of festive celebration, whereas papers like The Guardian uh, tend to be rather more in favour of the clampdowns. Uh, but it could be that there's a, a, a po-face reason for this, that uh, the Tory tabloids tend to back people like restaurant owners, pub owners and shopkeepers. Now, what about the theatres closing? We've just been asked in the chat, and that'd be a, uh, a nice thing to talk about briefly. Why did they, whether it was Cromwell or other Puritans, why, why did they close the theatres, tear down the maypoles? I mean, it was an attack on fun. They tore down maypoles because they were associated with licentiousness and boozing and unwanted pregnancies, punch-ups and general bad behaviour. 
So there's a perfectly straightforward social Puritan reason for closing down maypole dancing and village revels. But theatre is different. I mean, theatre is quite orderly unless there's a particularly bad play in a particularly bad crowd. Uh, theatre is scary to totalitarian regimes. Uh, there's nothing quite like theatre in a pre-cinema, pre-radio, pre-TV age for putting satire on stage. You know, that was the parliament that was. Uh, you can lampoon political figures on stage with absolute forensic brilliance. And the revolutionary parliamentarian regime was too unpopular, too recent, too insecure to leave that own goal open. So it's a bit like a sort of Trotskyite uh, dictatorship. They were scared of being sent up in case it would destabilise their authority or power. Yeah, there's a lot in common between Warsaw Pact countries and Puritan England. But then there's a lot in common between Puritan England and the radical religious right in America now. Now, what about the Dickens Christmas? Because Christmas changed again in Victorian times, didn't it? Yeah, the, the, the basic guide to Christmas festivity, you know, the uh, back of the postage stamp guide, is that individual Christmas customs never last long. If you're looking at an individual custom, you can bet it isn't much older than a few hundred years, if that. Uh, but basic forms of festivity are timeless. Uh, so the oldest things we do now, those are literally prehistoric, a Christmas dinner, Christmas decorations, and Christmas presents, except they used to happen at New Year till the 19th century. So what we get out of the Victorians are Christmas tree, Christmas card, Christmas stocking, which they still did when I was a boy. Uh, hang on, these are all sort of the sort of quite commercialised elements of the feast, aren't they? No kidding. It's one of the things the Victorians do really well, is sell things to the world. And Santa, in his Americanized form, and most of our current Christmas carols, a uh, 19th century, but a lot of the most popular. And the arrival of the turkey as uh, the centrepiece of uh, initially the middle class Christmas dinner. Snogging under the mistletoe is only slightly older. It's about as old as George Washington. It appears in London in the late 18th century. So it's nothing to do with Druids, which is what some people think. I, th I think they get that from Asterix, don't they? Druids and mistletoe. No, they get it from the ancient Romans. They get it from uh, a, a Roman scientist called Pliny, who was so dedicated to science that he insisted on inspecting the eruption of Vesuvius at close quarters to take notes and probably got killed. Uh, a true martyr for the scientific art. He said that Druids thought mistletoe was their most sacred plant if they found it on an oak tree, not when they found it in anything else. And when they founded an oak tree, they had this amazing ritual involving white cattle and white robes and golden sickle on the sixth day after the next new moon, after finding it. So there's no connection with midwinter and there's no connection with mistletoe in general. It's mistletoe and an oak tree. If you know your botany or just your countryside, you'll know the whole point is you almost never get mistletoe in an oak tree. I know of two mistletoe oaks in England at the moment. Only two? Uh, Pliny the Younger, incidentally, was Pliny the dead scientist's son. He survived to write nice things about his dad. Now, before we move on to a little bit of music from Will Summers, who I think is going to play a couple of uh, Tudor carols or tunes on his crumb horn uh, or recorder, can you just give us one last thought on hospitality? Because that was a, in your books, you said that was a huge part of Christmas. It still sort of is. Um, and did that, was that a particularly medieval uh, or, or Tudor idea, hospitality and giving things, or has that always been a part of Christmas? Hospitality, entertaining family and friends has always been a part of midwinter, but so has charity. From the earliest records, people went around collecting food for the sick, the poor, the old, the orphaned. And the able-bodied and poor managed to provide the entertainments for the wealthier uh, in the pubs, in the streets, uh, or in the big houses uh, by performing ritual plays, dances, singing songs. That's why Christmas carols have lasted at Christmas and died out at other times of the year. 
And it's a really good idea to make sure that the poor uh, are given a, an opportunity to celebrate at Christmas, because if you're celebrating and they can't, they might just cut your throat. <laughs> Bread and circuses. So let's go over to Professor Hutton. Thanks so much. And um, uh, don't go away because there'll be questions in a moment. We're just going to have a little musical interlude from Will. Uh, he's a probably the closest thing that we have in the modern era to the kind of minstrel or entertainer that uh, Ronald was just alluding to. Um, William Summers, are you there? Tom calling Will Summers. To, it's time for your music session. Where is he? Excellent. I'm here. Oh, excellent. Yeah, great. I thought so I'd Will, uh, Will, where are you? Let's let just have a quick introduction. Because um, I know that you you're in, you in you live near Hampton Court. Um, I, I'm still living. Yeah, and you, yeah. you run Loki Music, which is all about uh, bringing early music to new audiences. That's it. I, I live near Hampton Court in Hampton itself, by the river. I was born near the river, about not too far from here. And yeah, I run um, little concerts in historic venues, nice little sociable concerts in small places, not costing too much, always with food and drink and chat. Um, some people have just turned up not interested in music, just want to see the building and they hear some music as well. That's fine by me. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll play anywhere, but I like little spaces, little resonant spaces and time for food and drink and chats and socialising as well. Now, what are you going to play for us now, Will? I'll play a 15th century party tune, French. I beg your pardon, say that again? A 15th century party tune from France. OK, lovely. Thank you, Will. Uh, am I alone in having a slightly odd volume experience there? I did too. You did too. Okay. Well, well let, let, let's have another go. Will, I don't know if you can change your settings. We had a little bit of a wobbly uh, um, sound. Oh, let me see. Maybe because I had to sign back in. Um, uh, that's possible. And we've had another suggestion. You may be too close to your mic. But I don't think that is. I think it's probably because you had to sign back in. Tom, why don't we go over to a couple of Q&As while um, Will yeah, changes. Will. And then we'll call him to do another song in a sec. Yeah. Uh, Professor, Hutton, Professor Hutton, did you know that was such an old tune? I'm sure you did. A section on. D did you know that that tune that Will played was um, uh, so old? Uh, yes, but uh, I have no business to do so. We're, we're, will is the expert. Can I, can I take a question that's already come up mm -hmm. on the screen? Yeah. Uh, and it's about Abbots Bromley, which has a horn dance in early September, which is a really beautiful reproduction of the kind of dance of the horned men that the early medieval Christian bishops banned. The problem with this is it's not a continuous survival. It began in the 17th century when these amazing reindeer antlers which are imported, they come from a castrated domestic herd, were added to the local hobby horse dance to create a unique dance. But for me, that doesn't matter very much because the sight and the spirit of the dance is genuinely primeval. It may not be a continuous survival, but it's a very, very faithful and unconscious recreation of something really ancient. So thank you, the person who raised the point about Abbots Bromley. Yeah, great question. Uh, Professor, how will you celebrate Christmas? What's your perfect way of doing it? Uh, it won't affect, I'm not affected very much this year by the national problems. Uh, I retreat to my family in the wilds of Wales. We're in the middle of nowhere, so it's free holly and ivy from the woods. 
and uh, a quiet time watching the sun return and enjoying each other. Lovely. Victoria, questions? Oh, yes, yeah, got loads of questions. Could we have Alana and then could we have Xenia, if I'm pronouncing them right? Alana, are you there? Uh, thrilled to be here. So excited. Um, Great. I wrote, what did I write? I said, oh, I've been doing a lot of other uh, Zoom things, learning about Yule traditions. And the, uh, I would love to know if Hutton, if Professor Hutton, if you know, I heard the Druids worship trees and decorated them during midwinter as a veneration and thanks for the medicines the trees offer for winter. And that this may be why we have Yule trees. What do you think, Professor Hutton? I think the Druids would certainly have venerated trees because absolutely everybody in pagan Europe and the Near East did so. It's a natural thing for uh, ancient peoples or indeed sensible peoples to do. That probably isn't the origins of our present day Christmas trees uh, because they come from Germany. They appear in Germany at Strasbourg Cathedral in 1604 when a tree was brought in and covered in candles. And the people of Strasbourg liked it so much, they took it up and then it spread through Germany. And it arrived in England with German refugees from the French Revolution. But even in 1860, the much admired Charles Dickens could still refer to the Christmas tree as this new German toy. But there was a very influential German around, Prince Albert who married Queen Victoria, installed a German Christmas tree at Christmas at Windsor Castle, and it became fashionable among us and has been so ever since. So it was a sort of a royal thing, really. It wasn't so much pagan. It was that we were copying our betters in the social hierarchy. Uh, no, we are just taking up something that looks really cute when it's covered in lights. I love them. <laughs> they're, they're big enough to decorate. You put, you put presents under them. But yeah, again, the custom, the specific custom may be recent in English terms, British terms, but the form is very old because decorating homes with greenery at midwinter goes back to ancient times. Uh, holly and ivy in the north because they're simply the most common winter greenery around. Great. That's a good, good answer. Um, could we have Xenia, and, and while you're unmuting Xenia, I'm just going to ask Steve's question to you, Ronald. Steve asks me to ask you, can you, are, are horned dancers only British or are they prevalent elsewhere in Europe? And that's Fiona, actually, on Steve's chat. The answer is they are found elsewhere in Europe. They tend to be found sporadically in different places. And uh, some have the horns of bulls and some have the antlers of stags, but they're not very widespread. Uh, they're not as widespread, for example, as people dressing up in greenery and flowers and carrying garlands to welcome in summer. There's not as not widespread as lighting sacred fires to protect yourself and uh, your, your house and farm at midsummer. Uh, they're, they're, they're not a universal uh, or even very common traditional European custom since the early Middle Ages, uh, which is really rather a shame because you know, they're, they're very impressive. Okay. Xenia, are you there? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm here. Right. Um, yeah. Hey, hi, hi. Nice, What's your nice, question? Nice How are you? Can we just say nice pagan antlers, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> Hail yeah. the goddess. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Ronald, um, one question about the origins of the Marie Hluid and Krampus. Pagan origins, or are they general folk custom for customs that came later and don't have any um, religious or uh, pre Christian origins? Again, uh, the form is really ancient. The exact modern type of it is not so ancient. Uh, Krampus is one of a number of German and Austrian folk figures, like uh, Frau Pecht is another in uh, southern Germany and uh, Austria, uh, who appear in the Middle Ages and early modern period as midwinter spirits, personifications of winter. Uh, this doesn't mean they're not authentic. It doesn't mean they're not very potent. It just means that people are endlessly creative 
they keep on producing new figures over time to replace or join the old as part of a process of uh, doing renewed honour to a season. So it's admirable. As for the, um, the Marie Cloyd, uh, Marie Lloyd, uh, the horse's skull carried around South Wales, uh, that, like a lot of animal heads carried around at midwinter, only appears in the early 19th century, the end of the 18th century, uh, replacing earlier Welsh customs. And they all, these seem to evolve out of the earlier hobby horse dance, which was a Christmas fad of the early modern period, uh, appears in the 14th century, takes the early modern period by storm, and then people get bored and it, uh, it disintegrates into a number of really colourful local manifestations. The Hooden Horse in East Kent, the Old Horse of the Southern Pennines, the uh, Old Toop, the Ram in Derbyshire, it, all, all these are other versions. My local version near me in the Cotswolds is uh, the Horned Bull, the Broad. Uh, uh, thank you very uh, much. Uh, sorry, thanks, Senior. I, I, um... Uh, Madam Eater has asked, has Professor Hutton written any books on Christmas? Well, I think most of it's in here, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Uh, and son. and um, of course, you have recently recorded a, a online course on festivals for... The Idler. Yes, The Idler again. Yes. <laughs> Which is wonderful, absolutely wonderful. So do watch that, everybody. I know quite a lot of your students who've watched it already are in the audience, Ronald, and loads of our subscribers as well. Um, could we have June and Jerry and then Nick, Nick Spaulding, please, with your questions? You there, June and Jerry? Are you unmuting? Here you go. Hello. Ooh, hello, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, hey. Hello. My mum always instructed us we had to burn the holly on Twelfth Night. It couldn't go out of the house. Um, and something about the spirits that had come in with it not being allowed to escape. Is, was that a thing? It's a very, very old idea that uh, if you leave up Christmas decorations past a certain date, then you invite bad luck. But the exact date has changed regularly. It was uh, the uh, 1st of February in the 17th century. So if you still have your decorations from Christmas up after the 2nd of February, then you, you get the goblins. And then it withdrew to Twelfth Night. So if you still have your decorations up on the 7th of January, then you're in trouble. But increasingly, there seems to be a trend which personally I find rather annoying because I love Twelfth Night. Twelfth Night is the last great party of the Christmas period. And a lot of people are rushing to take their decorations down on Twelfth Day, the 6th, thinking if they're still up by the night, then you're in trouble. And this gets rid of all the wonderful Christmas partying finale of Twelfth Night itself. Oh, uh, um, Ronald, that's interesting because every year we have an argument within our family. Well, it, actually, it's just me against everyone else. Uh, I say, OK, it's 12th night. I'm going to tear all the decorations down. I don't want anything still up on, on the 7th. Uh, and the rest of them think this is a miserable, miserable attitude. I mean, are they right? Um, it depends what period you're choosing, Tom. Uh, <laughs> but I suggest that you, hey, just, just get idle. And yeah, give it a couple chill of out on Twelfth Night and leave them up until the next day, Saint Distaff's Day, the 7th of January. That's okay. when you're supposed to pick the decorations down and go back to work or cradling. So yeah, good. yeah, and have a big party on the 6th. Okay, so 7th they can come down. I'm just taking this down. If, if we forget it, we can show our children the recording. <laughs> I, I have no idea what a political minefield I was entering when I spoke about that. <laughs> Um, Nick Spaulding. Yes, Ronald, um, you referred to the banning of a ceremony involving the old woman. And mm. I've got my very old copy of Fraser's Golden Bough in front of me because I remembered there was a ceremony in the Tyrol on the last day of 
carnival involving burning the old woman. Are these are these related? Uh, we don't know. Yes. It could be that the old woman burned at carnival is a symbol of winter. And uh, there, there are quite a lot of folk rituals about burning or drowning or banning the spirit of winter uh, once you get around February or March, uh, which was an understandable letting off of steam when winter is lingering. But uh, whether that is the same figure as the late antique, early medieval old woman, we just don't know. I'm so sorry. Okay, fantastic. I've had to mute Nick, so he's not going to respond to you, Ronald, because there was a funny noise coming from his screen. Thank you for your question, Nick. And I think we've just got probably one last question. Um, Brooke, you had a question. Are you there, Brooke? I'm here. I've forgotten my question. I'm I'm riveted <laughs> by the chat. I'm riveted by I is there here's my question. Is there is there anything you don't know, Professor Hutton? <laughs> I only know about seasonal festivals and a few other things. I'm sublimely ignorant about most of the facts of life. <laughs> no, I think I think you've got it nailed. I think you've got it cornered. I thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. Well, yeah, you, yeah, I hope everyone can see wh why um, now wh why Professor Hutton is the idler's favourite historian. Um, because it's not only that he knows everything, but he's got a wonderful way of putting it over with, um, uh, you know, sort of gentle wit. Now, can I just ask a quick question? What about what about Christmas stockings? Um, shouldn't this be banned over the age of eighteen? Uh, I think that's a political question, and my lawyer <laughs> advises me not to go near it. But <laughs> Chris, Christmas stockings, like the Yule log and Christmas trees, are, are German. Vorsprung durch Technik. Uh, they're a German custom of the 18th century, and they're brought over to England in 1854 and appear in a children's story uh, taken from the German. And the story becomes amazingly popular, and the Victorians begin hanging up stockings, or if they're generous, pillowcases. So, again, it has a sort of literary source. Yes, uh, but it's Victorian. The Victorian middle class were great readers. There wasn't a lot of other entertainment for the Victorian middle class. You know, there were 269 people listening to this uh, a short while ago. Uh, I suddenly saw that and thought, oh, my God. Uh, if you feel logically interesting, the God is Saturn at this time of year. Um, it's actually a lot more than that, because a lot of these people are in twos, you know. Oh, my goddess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably much nearer four, four, 400. Because we love you, Professor Ronald Hutton. And can everybody give him a great round of applause for some of the... Excellent, excellent talk. Bravo.